Hello, everyone. We'll I'll slowly get started here as folks continue to log in. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you're logging in from. Thank you for participating. I'm very pleased today to have our, our two guests talking about the initiative for funding consciousness research through the Register Report mechanism. We have Dr. Marja Delicia. She's a senior researcher and lecturer, and lecturer at Lucerne University and Zoltan DNS, Professor of Experimental Psychology at Sussex. Um, and he's also the Registered Report Editor at Neuroscience of Consciousness. Um, uh, Marja de Lucia is a researcher who's submitted to the uh, program so far, and she'll be talking about her experience and what she's doing with the Registered Report program and where she'll, how she'll be proceeding with that. Um, and Zoltan is highly experienced with reviewing Registered Reports um, at a variety of journals. And the main journal we're partnering with us on this initiative is, as I mentioned, Neuroscience of Consciousness. It's the society journal for the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. And we're very happy to um, be working with these great teams to advance open science and to advance uh, consciousness-related research. In a moment, I will... Uh, go through a little bit of an introduction about uh, what the initiative is and a couple of key requirements and deadlines that are coming up for it. And uh, the question and uh, chat features should be enabled. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. Uh, um, we'll be monitoring that throughout. If it's a clarifying question, uh, I'll, I'll stop or, or I'll interrupt one of the uh, one of our esteemed guests. Uh, otherwise, if it's a, sort of a content question that can um, wait to the end, we'll uh, make sure to get to all the questions. With that, I'm going to share my screen. So please give me one moment here. All right. Welcome everyone again. Uh, this initiative is supported by the Templeton, Templeton Moral Charity Foundation, and it's a partnership between uh, the Society for the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness and the Center for Open Science. Um, I re just realized I didn't introduce myself. I am David Meller, Director of Policy here at the Center for Open Science. We are a nonprofit organization located in the U.S. whose mission is to advance transparency, trust, and reproducibility in scientific research. And one of the main initiatives that we support and try to advance is that registered reports um, publishing, and in this case, funding mechanism. So this particular initiative is designed to fund confirmatory research that advances con consciousness studies through that two-stage peer review publishing model. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more details uh, later on, but just to make some clear definitions, the Register Report uh, publishing and funding model is where the ideas are uh, prepared ahead of time, uh, submitted to us at COS uh, for uh, preliminary approval for appropriateness for inclusion in the initiative, and then submitted to the journal for stage one peer review um, early on before any uh, key data have been study has been um, started. So that stage one peer review process is of the, the introduction, the proposed methods and the proposed analyses. At that point, once um, it, uh, in principle acceptance is given by the journal, which is their promise to publish regardless of the main outcome of the study, that's when the study commences and then the final stage of peer review occurs um, after results are, of course, known and submitted um, for a second stage two at the journal. And the key feature here with uh, tying um, funding to these proposed studies is to help make the process a little bit more efficient so that you know that um, money to support the work can also come uh, once it's been in principally approved for publication at the journal. So the key steps that uh, 
we are interested in is to send a pre-submission application to us at the Center for Open Science. I'll make sure to share this uh, link in just a moment after I stop sharing my screen, but it's at cos.io slash consciousness. And those applications include a structured abstract, a budget that um, has a maximum of 50,000 US dollars. It has to be, of course, relevant to advancing consciousness research, um, be a confirmatory study with very clear hypotheses. Um, and then the um, those that are appropriate for inclusion into this initiative submit a full register report that full um, manuscript up to proposed methods and analyses to one of the eligible, eligible journals that publishes consciousness research or to an initiative that Zoltan will go into a little bit more detail, uh, posted on our preprint server and submitted to um, a, a community called Peer Community in Register Reports that uh, act equivalently to review and approve uh, proposed research uh, methodologies. The expectations for the work that is being conducted is that it must be as, uh, as open and transparent as possible. So as much open data as is ethically feasible, as many open materials that can be shared. If analytical code is used, um, post that as well. Once the journal provides in principle acceptance, that is registered. Uh, in, in an approved registry and to make openly available manuscript versions, ideally through preprint, um, but other venues might be possible as well. And that's, um, that's key to making, of course, the, the research as available, open and impactful as possible for others to, to use and reuse. The key deadline that we want to emphasize today is December 16 is when we want to have pre-submission applications sent to us. We are getting close to the, um, of course, to that date, and we're getting closer to the limit of uh, funds that are available for, for this. So please do submit those applications by that date. Um, at that time, uh, we'll, we'll no longer be submit, um, accepting pre-submission inquiries. There are no specific deadlines for later stages of submitting to the journal or commencing work, um, but the the the, um, the the program ends in summer of 2024, and so that's when we would expect uh, results to be shared through publication or, or preprinting or whatever is available at, at that uh, at that time. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I see we have a couple of questions, so I'm just gonna make sure I address those and then I'll pass it off to some of our esteemed guests. Let me just check the Q&A. Is it okay if you're applying for um, uh, related grants simultaneously? Yes, that is, um, we have seen several of those so far where um, people might be putting together a, a couple of different funding sources. So that is, um, that is feasible, yes. And I see something in the chat also, so just give me one more moment. Okay. Um, yeah, and for that, I will pass on to uh, Marcia. Would you be willing to give your, uh, description of the work that you're conducting and how you heard about this. Thanks a lot, David. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I applied for this um, grant scheme uh, earlier this year for a project that has to do with um, um, preserved neural functions in the absence of consciousness. Uh, I heard about this through some advertisement of the ASSC, if I'm not mistaken, early this year. And I decided to apply because I had an idea that I think I, I thought that uh, could fit very well this type of scheme. Uh, it's a project uh, that we started already a few years ago. 
And uh, it's uh, about um, assessing whether in uh, unconscious states, specifically in comatose patients, uh, we can find evidence of uh, regularity in coding uh, using EEG um, in uh, comatose patients during the very first hours after coma onset. And uh, a few years ago, we already published some results uh, that indeed, um, even in unconscious states, the brain is capable of encoding some complex type of regularity. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we thought that uh, it would have been important to first replicate these results and then uh, trying to find ways to um, even making these results more uh, evident, more striking, more convincing uh, by using um, higher density EEG systems and also trying to generalize what we found in uh, about 24 patients at the time uh, to a bigger cohort and across different type of clinical management. So in this new project, we have uh, multiple sites that are uh, involved. And um, meanwhile, also the clinical management of these patients has been updated. Uh, specifically, uh, there are different sedative agents that are administered to these patients. And also uh, they are treated with uh, what is called uh, targeted temperature management. So with body temperatures lower to different target um, temperature. And since the EEG signal is affected by all these factors, by having a bigger cohort and with multiple sites, uh, we in this new project, we're trying to also disentangle all these different um, factors that can influence our results in terms of, in terms of EEG. So I applied earlier this year, and uh, the application is fairly straightforward. Uh, so as David said, is a, an extended abstract. Um, and then I received um, a positive feedback, I think not even one month later. So in comparison to many other funding scheme, I found this application not that painful. Um, and at the moment, I'm at the stage of... Um, Recent meeting the register reports, the first stage. Um, it's my first experience with register reports. There are uh, good and bad side that I can tell you about. The good side is that not knowing much about the new results in advance, I could really focus on uh, what is the background, what we already know, and what is the method that I want to apply without being you know, influenced by trying to fit the results with uh, the old story that I want to propose. So it's really only introduction and methods. There is also quite a lot of emphasis uh, on the um, effect size and uh, on the justification on the included number of participants, given what we expect in terms of effect size. So really makes you think explicitly about this more than a more standard type of publication. And the downside, I have to say that uh, maybe uh, this type of scheme is not ideal for more exploratory type of uh, analysis, although as far as understood up to now, uh, both um, planned uh, data analysis and exploratory uh, investigation can be accommodated in the final publication. So, of course, if you have a very high risk uh, type of project uh, and if this uh, first stage register report goes through, then you also uh, have to accept the possibility that uh, if you don't have the desired results, then you have to publish them anyway, which might not be psychologically um, acceptable for everybody. So I'm trying to accept it beforehand and uh, to that these results might not be replicated or there might be other reasons why we found it in the first instance, instance but not in this new project. Um, this is all what I wanted to say, but please let me know if there are questions or classification that you would like me to, to, to tell you about. Um, I'm available for this. Great, yeah, we'll be, um, if you have any, if anybody have questions about Marja's work or why it was, uh, she thought it was especially appropriate for submitting to the uh, register report mechanism, please put that in the chat. I believe you might also have the raise hand feature. 
And um, we can allow to talk there. Until questions come in, I'll pass it to Zoltan to talk about his experience with uh, editing, reviewing, and, and shepherded along many register reports. Zoltan. Um, well, I edit um, register reports on, um, uh, on, on the journal that uh, David mentioned, the journal of the, um, of the Society ASSC. Uh, but also, I'm involved um, with, with another route by which you can go, uh, which is Peer Community Inn. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, and um, just say that, that you're not limited to those to, to those to those options. Uh, if there was some other journal you're interested in, you could um, uh, talk to David, right? And you could say if that was a, a, a yeah. Neuroscience of consciousness and peer community in rich reports are kind of the, the two main groups of journals that we are encouraging folks to apply to. But other journals that accept registered reports may be acceptable if the disciplinary fit is, is appropriate. Um, but our contact information is on the website. So uh, if you have questions about that, let us know and we can double check to make sure that those would be appropriate. So Peer, peer Community Inn is, is um, uh, meant to be a, uh, and is an, an alternative to traditional publishing. Um, what, what happens is you you submit you, you upload your preprint uh, as a stage one. So once you got the got the acceptance um, from COS COS that um, um, your idea is basically sound, but what you could do is uh, write write up your stage one. In other words, your description of your your introduction, your methods and plan statistics. Put that on a archive like Sark Archive, um, OSF and so on. Uh, and then you can enter the peer community in registered reports system. Um, and that, that um, archived paper preprint um, will be edited and reviewed as, as per normal. And, and we take you through in peer community in all the way to stage, stage two. Uh, in other words, that's the point in a registered report. Stage one is when you're uh, when you're proposing your methods um, and analytic methods. You then get in principle acceptance um, to say that that's that's great. You can go ahead, um, and then you collect the data uh, following those methods, and then you submit your stage two, which is the complete manuscript with the with the analysis of the results. And in peer community, in we will um, um, get to the final stage of hopefully accepting that. And, and then, um, bear in mind at this point, this has all been on preprint archives, so it hasn't been published in any technical sense. I mean, you, you published it on the preprint archive, but it hasn't been republished by Peak Community Year. So that means you are available to have it published in any journal. So we have um, a set of a couple of dozen um, PCI, RR, Peak Community Year Registered Reports friendly journals, which guarantee they'll publish anything we've accepted, um, given it fits the journal remit. A and you have to pay the author processing charges if you if you want to go for those traditional journals. But I, I did say I wouldn't share a screen, but I could just share the screen um, to show you that list. So, so this is the list. You can get it by going to... Um, um, Peer Community in Registered Reports website. If you just type Peer Community in Registered Reports or PCIRR, you'll, you'll get it. And this is the list of journals uh, that, that include uh, Cortex, for example, that does consciousness uh, relevant uh, research, uh, Royal Society Open Science. Um, and there's there's some, some others there you may be interested in. So you can have a look at that. Um, Psychology of Consciousness. Psychology of Consciousness, obviously, clearly a consciousness-related uh, journal. Uh, so that is so th that is a process you can go through, um, which um, gives you gives you some power in terms of choice amongst these available journals. In terms of uh, which journal, journal journal that um, that you'll have. Um, 
it, it also incidentally shows that um, we as academics do all the work. So if you want to pay author processing charges to a journal, fine, go ahead. You might want to ask yourself in the end what is gained by that. Um, but um, anyway, that, that's the process. Now, what, one thing to consider when you when you pick a pick a journal here is that they'll have different requirements for the registered reports, um, and so you need to look at if you're interested in a particular journal on the list here. Um, you need to look at what it is they're asking for. Um, for example, Cortex wants a two percent significance level with ninety percent power, or it wants uh, correspondingly a base factor threshold of more than six or less than a sixth. Most journals would have five percent significance, obviously, but you need to check the power requirements, and most of them would have. Uh, correspondingly base factor thresholds of three and a third. Uh, Royal Society Open Science doesn't have such particular requirements. Uh, and that's because um, you can argue there are some situations, like, like, like um, with Marcia, I was, I was wondering how you, you, how you got your power up if you're dealing with patients. I mean, that, that can be a, a tough thing. And it's, it's not always possible if you're dealing with patients with select populations to get the high power that might be required, for example, by cortex. Um, but the data is still worth having because it can be built on. So that's the philosophy of Royal Society Open Science. Um, just discuss with the editor and reviewers, you know, you make your case for what you can do and why, why that's valuable. But in most of the, the journals, <clears throat> what they're, they're looking for in a registered report is that you can give an answer to a question, because this is confirmatory research, uh, normally registered reports. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the typical situation. So there must be grounds for saying um, you have support for H0 or H1 for the hypothesis of no difference or of, or of difference. Or to put it another way, uh, what you would like to do is test a theory because it's a confirmatory research and you'd like to severely test it, obviously. It'd be nice to severely test it. But you can only severely test a theory if, if you can have strong grounds for supporting H0 or supporting H1. Uh, say, good evidence for H0 or good evidence for H, H1. So that means you need to have worked out in advance um, that you can produce enough subjects, you can collect enough subjects, and you, you're committing to collecting enough subjects, items, uh, whatever is required, uh, to get the sensitivity, to get the sort of support you need um, for the null hypothesis or, or the alternative hypothesis. And as Matsi was saying, this... Um, this is the point, really, where people haven't done registered reports before, sort of first come unstuck or first find a difficulty or, or first find they need to think in a way they haven't quite thought about before. Because if you want to falsify a theory or have it, uh, evidence count against a theory that predicts an effect, um, you need to be, if you're dealing with frequent statistics, you need to be powered to pick up the sorts of effects that are uh, relevant to that theory. So if you don't want to miss out on the effects that are relevant to the theory, you need to be, have the power to pick up on all effects that could be relevant and support that theory. That means you need the power to pick up, by logic, the, the minimal interesting effect size for that theory. So can you scientifically justify what that is in order that the statistics are connected to the theory testing? So that so that's uh, that, that that can be a difficult thing, but something you need to you need to think about. Or in terms of a base factor, it's slightly easier, but you do need to say what is the sort of effect that I that is being predicted here by the theory. Um, so a default base factor uh, is one where you just say, oh, there's this default of X size that I'll pull out off off the um, off the shelf and test my theory with that. But why is that relevant to your theory in the context of this particular experiment? You've got to justify it. So that, that can be, that's sort of the first sticking point for people. And then when you're, when you're pushed to justify why these effect sizes you're coming up with are relevant to your theory in this particular scientific context, 
So that takes a bit of thought. Um, and then you work out how many numbers would be required um, to have the sensitivity to get support for H0 or H1. It's, it's typically more a bigger N than is routine in experiments and studies in the field. Um, so when you do the registered report, you're likely looking at um, rather greater N than you used to. In other words, you can't just say in, in you know, my field, we typically run 20 subjects. So that's what I'm going to do because that isn't going to fly. Um, so that, that, I mean, that'll affect your budget as well. So bear, bear that in mind. Uh, so the, the budget you put in initially when you first submit your proposal is a tentative budget. And then that will be updated if it needs updating as you go through the process and uh, reviewers and editors suggest that uh, you might need more subjects. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, do you think that this type of format uh, of a register reports article will be eventually accepted by any type of journals? Or do you think there is a reason why only some journals accept this so far? It's just a matter of time or is it what other things are, have to be considered? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look at, I mean, Richard's report started um, 2013 in Cortex and Chris Chambers uh, set up the team mm -hmm. there, of which I, I was a member. There was something like it beforehand, but it was when, when Chris set it up in 2013 that he made it strict that we will make this work and we'll, we'll nail this down so that everything everything is tied together. So the, the first real register report is 2013. And when, when you look at the uh, sort of reactions on the web at that time about it, there was a lot of people who say, oh, this will never work, we're bad for science. And, and, and it, um, it's quite funny now looking back on it. Uh, and, and then the uptake has been phenomenal, really. I mean, in, 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 in terms of, you know, imagine a system like science has a large amount of inertia. Um, we're less than 10 years on and over 300 journals now offer this in all disciplines, uh, all sciences and, and humanities, even qualitative methods now. Um, so from, from that point of view, the uptake has been really quite, quite impressive and growing all the time. There's, there's always more journals taking up, taking up registered reports. Um, Peer Community Inn gives a way for any, any journal now to take on board registered reports because um, they can become a PCIR-friendly journal, and then we do all the work for them, you see. Because it's hard work for a journal doing registered reports. They, they, they need an editor who knows what they're doing, and they need to change the workflow system, uh, so, you know, what happens behind the bonnet, which needs updating for registered reports, and it can be a, a sort of a, a slow and difficult process. Um, so hopefully more journals will take it up now with Peer Community in. They just need to say we'll be PCIR-friendly, and we say, well, that's great. Um, and then they can use our expertise. Um, One question came through the... Yeah. One question came through about um, good examples of Bayesian uh, sampling plans. Um, mm -hmm. If you happen to know of any, I'm also um, looking through our resources now, but if you... Um, um, so, yeah, with... with uh, what, what we do with... Um, Bayesian sampling plans is, um, f first of all, decide on threshold, which might be decided for you, or Raw Society Open Science, you would decide, decide on it. Uh, so you need your base factor, say, to be more than three or less, less than a third. You can, um, now often with a registered report, uh, I mean, in fact, I'd recommend you run a sort of pilot if you haven't dealt with this sort of data before. I mean, if it's the sort of paradigm your lab has been used to running, then that's fine. Um, but if you if it's sort of a new paradigm uh, and you don't know what error variances are, I would I'd suggest running a pilot just to get an. I mean, you need to get an estimate of the error variance so you can do your power and uh, not uh, your power calculations, but also your sensitivity analysis for for base factor, and to make sure that um, you you know what's the, the sort of way th th these data behave. So um, if there's anything surprising thrown up. You, you sort of know about it already and can plan your analysis with full information about the sort of data that, these, that this sort of paradigm produces. So I would, either based on your past experiments or run a little pilot, which doesn't have to be the full experiment, it could just be one condition, for example, um, 
just just so you see what the data is like and the sort of error variance you have. Now, once you know um, a standard error, you can estimate um, how many subjects would be needed to have a 50% and 80% chance or whatever of reaching the base factor threshold of whatever it is, getting more than three, or what will take more subjects, less than a third, to get to get support for the for the null hypothesis, so so get an estimate of that, uh, and then you can say um, we will we will run subjects until the base factor is more than three or less than a third, or until we reach maximum, because you'll need some maximum there, um, so that there's some definite stopping point, uh, which uh, your your which is you know the, the the limit of your resources for that, and that maximum. Uh, uh, I, I don't think any journal has a particular rule about the relationship of that maximum to your estimate n, other than it's got to be a bit more than the estimated n. Um, so there's a bit of leeway there because the estimated n to get a certain base factor is just that, it's just an estimate. So you don't really know what your base factor is going to do once you actually run a certain number of subjects. Um, so you can put in some leeway, uh, unspecified amount, just a bit more, somewhat more uh, than the estimate you need to, to reach your base factor threshold. Any more questions? Yeah, one came through. I'm gonna be, uh, I'll type the answer, also answer live. Are there some chances? Um, I think this one will be for me for cost sharing, cost reducing um, in register reports with collaborative efforts, since a lot of these research costs account for the MRI and e EGG and PET costs. Um, to answer the first part of the question, yes. Uh, you know, if you're collaborating with others who are, you know, perhaps doing slightly different research questions, but you can, I was about to say kill two birds with one stone, but when we're talking about human subjects research, that might not be a good joke. Um, so you can collect multiple data sets at, you know, at one, at one point, that would be absolutely fine. Um, assuming logistically it can work out. Um, the second part of that question was, are permittable, is it permitted to access historical records from relevant institutions? Um, that's a maybe. And what I mean by that is that sort of that goes under the banner of using existing data. Uh, that that might be absolutely fine, especially if you don't have insights into what type of trends are already in that um, existing data set. Some journals will allow that as long as you assert how ignorant or not you are of those data sets and any insights that you have gleaned from them. The problem that there that we would try to avoid is generating a hypothesis knowing how much variation on the key factors are within a data set that biases what questions you're going to answer. And so you end up building a hypothesis and testing a hypothesis on the same existing data set. So to prevent that, there are guidelines that are journal specific. Some permit them, some journals do not permit it, but even if they do permit it, um, you can't have done any previous analysis or be aware of any trends in that data set that, if it exists. So that's a big maybe. Um, anybody else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, at Peer Community Inn, um, we, we came up with a systematic way of dealing with that that problem. The, the, the classic, classic registered reports case is where the data doesn't exist. So that's sort of what I've been talking about. Um, but we decided we would um, we would loosen that, but do so in a way in which the risk of bias is explicitly flag, flagged. So the degree of bias control is strongest when the data does not exist. That's what we call a level six. Um, a, a level five is um, the data exists, but there's no way you could have accessed it yet. Um, it, it's, it's hidden in some way. Or... The level down is the data does exist and you could have accessed it, but you haven't accessed it. Uh, and um, you, you need to give some assurance about that. So, and then we go down the levels to, to, to level one, where, uh, I mean, as you go down, you might have accessed the data and you might have even done some analyses on it, but you haven't analyzed the, the key thing that you're investigating. Clearly, there's a lot of risk there. Um, so what we do is we just highlight that risk and we ask for more controls and more reassurances and more, you know, you know sort of uh, familiarized error rate type corrections and 
and, and that sort of thing. Um, so at PICMU DN, we will, we, will, we will consider registered reports at all levels of risk, but bear in mind that the risk will be explicitly stated that this, this is an example of this type. Uh, and so we don't guarantee it's as bias-free as, as the greatest level of, of risk control. But in terms of looking then at a, at, at a journal, as, as David was saying, you want to take it to from peer community in, um, you'd have to see what level of bias control that journal would be, would be happy, ha happy with. But a community in itself, we deal with all levels of bias control. And I just put in a link to that, um, to those guidelines for PCI. So people should be able to take a look at that. Let me share my screen for just one second, just to show people what those, what they'll be looking for. So this is the um, the different levels of risk that uh, Zoltan was just describing. And, okay. Something else we do at Peer Community in, which is another yet another innovation. Um, is we can, one thing to bear in mind with a registered report is there's a certain time delay because um, you need to go through the review process before you start collecting your data. Right. So, and that, that review process takes as long as it does uh, in, in you know, a, a typical sort of article when you go through submitting it and finally getting your acceptance. It takes, it's about the same number of back and forths. And um, so, you know, it could be six months or something um, for when you submit to you get in principle acceptance, IPA, which means your stage one has been accepted and you can start collecting the data. So there's a six month lag before you can even start. So what, what we have is a scheduled track submission um, where you write up a brief summary of what you're going to do, which would be pretty similar to what you would submit to COS in the, in, in the first place about um, your idea. Um, and then we send that out to reviewers and say, Say so in six weeks' time, you'll, you'll get a manuscript. Do you guarantee to review it within a five-day uh, interval? And reviewers will say yes to that. They'll say yes on these specific dates, so between you know, Monday and Friday on the, the, these dates. I'll, when I get that manuscript, I'll do the review in that time. So now uh, then you as an author have, well, you're giving yourself an obligation. You have to write it up now in that whatever time is agreed. It's, but let's say it's six weeks. You're giving yourself six weeks to write it up. You, in um, satisfying that obligation, what you gain is you get the reviews back in five days. Uh, and so, and the system works as, um, as advertised. Uh, it's now our most popular form of submission. So that dramatically improves the initial review stage. This is a facility not offered by any journal, only through peer community. In. Can I ask you, what's your experience about um, the final acceptance from traditional journals of the paper that went through this process eventually? Yeah, the journals I mean, are happy you, to take it, take them in? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what the, 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 the friendly journals that I listed, they've guaranteed it. So there's no question okay. about it. They will take it. It's your choice. So all the friendly journals, uh, given you satisfy the remit of the journal, which is decided by peer community in, uh, and given you've satisfied their, um, their, their explicit requirements, for example, power of 90% for 2% significance or base factor, yeah. or whatever it is, given you satisfied those simple requirements and then you pay the APCs, it's guaranteed. There'll be no further reviewing process. Um, mm -hmm. There'll be reformatting into sort of journal format, but there'll be no, no further reviewing process. Yep. There are a lot of advantages to doing it that way if you, uh, you can't tell our enthusiasm about it. And I would say, I hope this is the future of scientific publishing as well. Um, we pay billions to for profit journals for what? You asked earlier, if, you know, if, if um, will all journals be doing it this way in the future? It, and, and um, you know, we don't know, but it, it does kind of uh, highlight that the benefits of how science and reviewing 
should work. And it, and it also, as old time, you mentioned, it sort of highlights, you know, who's doing the real, um, heavy lifting in a lot of these, these practices. So, um, th there are, there are a lot of key benefits that the, uh, system provides through, through, through the, um, through, through that peer community and, uh, burgeoning of, of preprints. Um, uh, Sultan, do, do you mind talking a little bit about the logistics of that? Once you post it on a, uh, a preprint server, um, pretty much any preprint server would be appropriate is mm -hmm. uh, bio archive. Yes. Um, Sci archive. Um, yeah. Uh, those are probably the two most likely ones I would imagine. Yeah. Um, comments come in and, and then it, you, you, you stick with the same preprint, but you update the version when, once you incorporate the comments through a couple of rounds of, of reviews. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But you are so an eight, also I imagine, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, so once the work is, is, you know, finally completed, you, you might have four or five different versions of the, of the preprint going from, you know, you know, preliminary to revise, to re-revise, to finally having some data, to having some um, cleaned up and, and, and commented on data. So, um, but that all, uh, the history of that all is retained within that, that will the be retained. versions of the preprint. Uh, yes. I mean, the author has control over that and that they put it up. But what we do is once we've accepted the stage one, we put up a version ourselves we control over. Gotcha. So that, that means that that's, that version we put on 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 um, OSF um, is safe in the sense that it's guaranteed to be there. Gotcha. So it's, okay. the stage one is always searchable, always available, and will always be available, and it's guaranteed to be the stage one that we accepted because we put it there. Gotcha. So you you mean essentially editorial control or the the, the rights of the yes. the accepted once it's accepted. Yes, that's right. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Margin. No, I was asking whether there is some form of animation of these um, comments coming in or moderation. I mean, because if you post a preprint in any of these archive, uh, comments will not come naturally, right? So do you invite them? Yeah, yeah so no, exactly. So what you do is you go onto the peer community and website, which you mm -hmm. could think of. We're not a journal in the sense we don't publish in a, in mm -hmm. a technical sense. But you go on the peer community web website and then it, it's as if you're dealing with a journal because then you deal with an editor, we would call them a recommender. I see. And the recommender then solicits reviewers just as they normally would until they get a, uh, um, you know, a wide number of reviews and, they, and then they go back and forth. So it's, it's not uh, just sort of an open invite to anyone to make comments and we'll bear those comments in mind. I mean, the authors could do that themselves, uh, but th that isn't the peer community. That isn't part of the peer community in the process. Yeah. And if one wants to become part of it as a reviewer or as? Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to go, um, uh, go to peer community and register reports, you can, you can have, a, have a look at, look, look, look at our uh, content there and uh, have a read. Um, you, you could put in an expression of interest of being a recommender, which is, which is our editor. And, and one thing I'd also suggest, I mean, I'm going through, I, I send per personally my registered reports, which I'm working on, I go through peer community in, but I'd like a peer, peer community in as a set of communities. And each community is what you could think of as like a journal. So registered reports is one community. Uh, the other communities tend to be biology-based, neuroscience um, and things, but it can be anything. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like is for people to maybe set up a community that could be, for example, consciousness science. Yes, that then, would then be my then my work on consciousness mm -hmm. could go to peer community in consciousness. Yeah, um, and I'd be very I to be honest with you, I'll be very happy. Frankly, I'd be happy to keep it there and not go to the journals mm -hmm. because the work has already been done. And and as long as that the editorial team is highly, uh, you know, um, a, a very good people, then uh, then then it has the the quality assurance that any journal would uh, would give it. So if anyone does want to set up their own community in a discipline related to consciousness or consciousness it's, itself, I would happily recommend that. Good. Uh, a very related question just came in, and we've kind of been um, answering it in little bits and pieces, but you know, what's the, what is the point of the journals um, at that point? 
small proposals <laughs> go through the same review pipeline, what distinguishes between a study published um, in one versus another journal. Yeah, what is the point of the journals? I think that's a good question. Um, and Pete Munity sort of highlights that. I mean, at, at, at the moment, what you gain is the prestige, because when you go to promotion committees and so on, they say, oh, you, know, you, you publish there. And, um, you know, that's all fantastic. But what what is that all about? That's that's just show, really, isn't it? Um, so once Peer Community Inn has his own prestige, which I hope it has, uh, then you don't you don't need that. And I, and I hope things are changing, I mean, shifting. I mean, within the UK, for example, I don't know what's going to happen to the REF Research Excellence Framework, but which universities are uh, assessed. Uh, but there will be a movement within that, we're told, to open science practices. A greater emphasis. Yeah, and I, and, and I would add, as the reputation awareness demonstration of this work is um, you know, held to the same standards of, of importance and credibility, as that um, reputation expands, then um, what you're just saying will become, I'm not sure, less and less relevant you know the, the today we we often use the the journal prestige as kind of an indicator or shorthand of of that reputation um and so it'll take a little time to yeah percolate out studies have been done that. several studies now including recent yeah. one rules study open science that methodological quality is not correlated with journal impact factor once you're above a minimal amount in fact there's even negative relationships so what that means is when you when you pay say ten thousand dollars to publish in Nature, you're just joining an, joining a rich person's club, which there's no guarantee, which which, which does not in, in fact indicate better quality. I mean, as soon as that is realised, and what what you're rewarded for is openness and rigour, then hopefully that whole system dies away. We are the revolution. <laughs> right, um, maybe I missed this, but the deadline for abstract is December 16th, correct? Um, at which point do you have to have the register report ready? So um, that, that's correct. The first point, December 16th, for submitting, and I'll put a link um, in, in just a second to the structured abstract um, through, through our website. There is no specific deadline um, after that for submitting a complete register report to a journal, but um, the uh, end of summer 2024 is when the, the program will be wrapped up. And so there is um, a moderate amount of time pressure to, to submit that register report early on. So I would encourage it to be as um, relatively speedy. Without without putting too much pressure on you, let me just put a couple of links into the chat right now. After that, structured abstract. I, I believe questions are dying down, um, and we've gone through a lot of information and. A lot of basic information, a lot of uh, talk about the future revolution of scientific credibility, transparency, and uh, overall awesomeness. Uh, either of you have any closing remarks or thoughts about uh, what you'd like to uh, see happen in the next uh, uh, couple of years with your work or... Um, or anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? Um, yes, maybe I can say something about this new experience that I had with the register reports. I mm -hmm. think that uh, in the end, it might be a scheme that I can accommodate any kind of project. So potentially it's something that can be really become a standard. So maybe I'm repeating what also you, you already said. Um, so maybe it would be really great if um, the Center for Open Science would also open new calls for different topics. And um, I think uh, this could be a success. Uh, for consciousness, I believe uh, there has been quite a lot of buzz around studies that could not be replicated. So 
Potentially, this is one main target, but um, in psychology and cognitive neuroscience research, I think that there are lots of studies that could benefit from this type of scheme. Uh, so well done with this initiative. And um, let's see the results in the end. If I could just follow yeah. up on this. So, I mean, I, I, I phrase things, and we sort of phrase things, confirmatory research, you think of theory testing, that's, that, that's how I put it. Um, but it doesn't have to be strictly that. So um, during the pandemic, we had a registered report that was estimating a certain COVID-relevant parameter. Uh, and the idea was just to estimate it in an unbiased way and to get the benefits of registered reports uh, in that way. So if you wanted to just estimate the amount of something that's relevant to consciousness research, it doesn't have to be strictly theory testing, but you can still benefit from the registered report process uh, in, in, in doing that. Because, for example, in the, the beginning stage, in forming the stage one, you haven't done anything yet. So that means the discussion between reviewers, editor, and author takes on a completely different dynamic than a, a standard paper where everything is already done, because you're working together to get the best way of solving this problem which could be estimating parameter or could be testing theory, but w whatever it is. So you will gain and you can uh, you can change. But when, once you've already, in the standard paper, you've already done it. So if some reviewer says it should be done some other way, what you know, what you do, you dig your heels in and, and, and it becomes sort of defensive and a bit argumentative. Uh, of course, that's not to say you, you might not have disagreements in registered report, but it does feel different in working together to find the best solution and using everyone's uh, knowledge to find the best the best methods, um, sort of in terms of experimental paradigms, and also the best statistics to to answer this question. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah, when, when you're still developing what's going to be done, it's collaborative, trying to find a problem as opposed to uh, trying to convince that that what what did happen was the best way it, it should have been done, and uh, you're just wrong for. Uh, for thinking otherwise and by the way we can't rewrite history so what are you going to do about it all right i greatly appreciate your time for sharing your experiences sharing your your um, recommendations and processes thank you for all the participants for your great questions uh we look forward to your applications and we are Happy to be here. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day.